like to talk to you about really is um, the experimental nature of halacha. That halacha is not sufficient to sit in the base medrash, to make theories, to make hakiras, but halacha, like what you're doing here you know, the rest of your day, is also an experimental science. You at least have to get out and clarify the reality, the mitzius of what you're talking about. The example we're going to use is kosher animals. It's after the nine days. I figure it's safe to talk about that now. It won't make anybody feel bad that, you know, we'll talk about it, and then you can't eat. So before we start, let me ask you, how do you know which animals are kosher? What? What are they? Split hooves and shoes it's cut. Okay, so it seems to be very simple. If I want to know which animals are kosher, look, does it have split hooves? Does it chew its cud? If yes, to both of those, it's a kosher animal. It would seem that uh, to now give an hour and a half talk will be difficult, but not to worry. Okay, here we have uh, the source of the Torah. This halacha appears in two places in Chumash. We have in Sefer Vayikra Pasha Shemini and Sefer Dvarim Pasha Zre'eh. The Torah gives us the rules of how you know which animals are kosher. The Torah actually divides the animal world into four categories. We have animals or mammalian quadrupeds, uh, birds, fish, and, uh, and grasshoppers. We're today going to talk only about the mammalian quadrupeds, the land animals for which the Torah says, and then the Torah goes on with four exceptions. What are the four exceptions? Well, the Torah tells us that the Arnevit, the Shafan, and the Gamal have only one of the signs. What are those? Which sign? Choose its cud. It's right, it's right there. It's on the wall. They chew their cud and don't have split hooves. So the Anevit, Shafan, and Gamal, not sure exactly what the Anevit and Shafan are. We'll just use the word Anevit and Shafan. And Gamal, we're pretty sure, means camel. So those three have one sign. They chew their cud. They don't have split hooves. And the fourth exception is the pig, which has split hooves and doesn't chew its cud. Okay, so the two signs are split hooves and chew its cud. And to make it even simpler, the Torah... In, uh, only once, only in Pasha A, not in Pasha Shemini, gave us a list of the kosher animals. It says, in case the signs aren't enough for you, these are the animals that you may eat. Shor, sex of him, zim. those are the three types of behema, bovines, uh, sheep family, the ovines, and goats. And then there are seven types of chaya, ayal, tzvi, v'yachmor, v'akov, v'dishon, uto, v'zomer. Those are the seven types of chayot, and that's it. Everything in those categories is kosher. Everything that you can't put into one of those categories is not kosher. Using modern taxonomy, and this is very important, modern taxonomy and halachic taxonomy are not necessarily one-to-one -one correspondence. In other words, today, those of you who have taken biology, you're familiar with classes and genus and species, etc. Chazal didn't have that. The Torah didn't have that. They used a different classification a system. And um, so, for example, when the Torah gives us those ten names that we just looked at a second ago, it doesn't mean ten species. It means ten categories or ten groups. And the way we divide it today is also arbitrary and for based on particular uh, definitions and for a particular purpose. It depends what your purpose is, how you're clarifying something. For example, anybody here study a little bit about plant biology? No, it used to be biology textbooks had like half plant, half animal. Today people don't, don't know plants exist, right? You do plants? Okay, there's a future for you because everybody else is forgetting about plants. Um, if you want to classify plants, there also you have a taxonomy system. And halakhically we have a taxonomy system also. For example, why do I care about taxonomy and halakha? Hilchus kelayim. I want to know which types of plants I could uh, plant together. Can I plant an orange and an esrog together? They're both citrus, they're both closely related. And indeed, the Chazanish says that it would seem to him that oranges and grapefruits and pomelos and esrogim are all the same species regarding the halacha of kelayim. That doesn't mean they're the same species regarding the halacha of esrog. When you need to take a, a priate hadar on sukkus, it has to be what we call an esrog. An orange doesn't count. A chushchush doesn't count. Nonetheless, when it comes to the halachas of kelayim, the definition of species is different. The same thing might be true for animals as well. If I need a sheep uh, to bring on the mezbeach, how do I define sheep? Well, there might be a very narrow definition because the Torah tells us what is the extra one of the emurim that goes on the mezbeach for a sheep? 
Analia. Yet if you go out and you look at the sheep that you see wandering around in the streets there, many of them don't have an alia. Could, is that type of sheep possible for the Mizbeach? Maybe, yeah. The alia is the big fatty tail, the big fatty like uh, pad, pillow, that's what? Does it have a technical name? I don't know. It's a big fatty thing on the back, okay? Instead of a tail, it has like a big pad. Uh, but yet we know that, for example, so for uh, the Corbin it might not be good, yet when else might I need sheep? Well, for example, according to many people, only Tzemer and Pishton require Tzitzim and Deraisa. And so therefore we try to make our beggar from wool. Is the wool from a sheep that doesn't have an alia considered wool as far as the halachas of Tzitzim? So most postcoms say yes. There's one guy in Sanhedrin who says no, and he insists on getting his wool and he spins it himself from sheep that have an alia. Most of us get our wool for our citrus from sheep that come from Australia that don't have an alia. Okay, so again, back to kosher animals. If we use the modern taxonomic definition, we'll find approximately 179 species, using the modern definition of species, that have split hoof and chew their cud, and that will somehow have to fit into those 10 categories that the Torah gave. Okay, so so far, pretty simple. How do we know what's kosher? Well, we have clear signs in the Torah. What else might be of interest? Well, it would seem nothing. It would seem from the Torah. I go out into the wilderness. I come across some animal. I want to know if it's kosher. Check. Does it have split hooves? Does it chew its cud? And that's it. If it does, it's kosher. If not, it's not kosher. But over the last few generations, another seeming requirement has been raised. And that's the question of misora. Now, why might we have a question of Mesorah? It indeed seems a little bit strange. If you look in the Mishnah, right, we've looked at the Torah. Torah gives us two signs and nothing else. Well, and, and a list. But in terms of identifying an unknown species, two signs. You look in the Mishnah. All the Mishnah tells us is Simone Behem of Achai and Nam and Torah. Un unusual for the Mishnah. Doesn't even give it any details. One second, the Mishnah just tells us that he's supposed to know Chumash. Before he started learning Mishnah, I, the Mishnah assumes you know all of Chumash by heart. Simona Behem of Chai Nemu Mana Torah. Zo, nothing more to talk about. Yeah? Just to clarify, the list of 10 is, are, ten it's, are examples? Of no, it's assumed to be exclusive, exhaustive, okay. not so only. Then, okay. So then the, if someone came across an animal that did have the two signs, then that wouldn't be kosher. Ah, well, the assumption is it will fit into one of those categories. So, for example, we have a whole lot of different types of deer that maybe fit under one. Antelopes, we have lots and lots of types of antelopes, even sheep. According to the modern definition of species, there are lots and lots of sheep. All of them will fit under the definition of sex of him. So here when we have these 10, the assumption is that these are broad categories. You might not know how to put it into one of those categories. Because I find some sort of new strange antelope. Is it a yachmor, an ako? I don't know exactly where to put it. But the assumption is that it fits into one of those 10 categories. So, so in answer to your question, the utility of the list is not so great today, it would seem, because we have the simonima. Uh, but it would also, I would say, that in the time of Mat and Torah, they knew what those ten categories were, and that that list did serve a, a more useful practical function. Okay, so the Mishnah lists only, the Mishnah doesn't even list the simonima. It tells you, go look in the Chumash. If we skip now a good, you know, 1400 years, and we get to the Shulchan Aruch. What did the Shulchan Aruch tell us? Well, the Torah Shulchan Aruch, not too much detail. Again, split hoof and shoe its cud. So the Shulchan Aruch, again, gives us a very simple uh, way of telling what's kosher and what's not. But what you have to pay careful attention here, this is in Shulchan Aruch Yorodeya, Simen Ayin Tet. Okay, Simen Ayin Tet is dedicated to telling us which animals are kosher and which not. If we now skip to the next simon, simon pei in Shulchan Aruch, simon pei is there to tell us which of these kosher animals are a behemoth and which are a chaya. Now why do I care what's a behemoth and what's a chaya? Okay, those are the two main ones, what? Chalev. Chalev is mutter and a chaya. Chalev is all kinds of certain fats that are in the animal. In a behemoth, in a cow, in a sheep, in a goat, we have to take those fats out. And that's the, the tedious process of nikor, and why we usually get rid of the hindquarters today. Um, so chalev is oser in a behemoth, in a chaya the chalev is mutter. Which why, for example, in New York, 
you could buy commercial venison, it's shakted by the OU, and the OU actually does nikor. They take out the Giranasha, but the whole rest of the hind quarter, there's no problem. Chalev is mutter in a chaya. Kisir Adam is a mitzvah that you have to do by a chaya and ofus, but not by behema. There are other bother, other, other practical differences. Uh, for example, let's say you mess up and you cook basva chalav, and there's some suffolk. So basva chalav is derice only by behema, not by a chaya. Um, also, the espino is only by a behemoth, not a chaya, etc. So, this siman is telling us how you know which animal is behemoth, which is a chaya. And look what he tells us. Chaya tahora, chelba mutar, the chelva is mutar, the dama osur, the blood is osur, behemoth, and a chaya, the ton kisur, the chaya after kisur dama. How do I know which is a behemoth and which is a chaya? So that Shokhanach tells us, v'chachmenu natnu simanim mi piashmua, bekano seha. If you want to know what's a behemoth and what's a chaya, look at the headgear. In English, we have two words, horns and antlers. In Hebrew, there's one word, keren. So he explains, if they're branched, meaning they're antlers, then vaday chaya tahori. If it has antlers, it's a chaya, nitzkir sadam, chaya levis mutter, etc. If it's not branched, tzorch sheboham shlosha simonim kruchos, Haduros v'charukos. Anybody can explain what those mean? Well, don't try because I'm not going to either. Because the shach tells us it's a little too complicated for me. He says, I don't really know. He says, I ain't perish at Ramel Beis Yosef. If you want to really know what they mean, look at the Beis Yosef. So what did the shach say? The shach now introduces a concept of mesoret. What's mesoret? How does Fiddler on the Roof call it? Tradition. tradition. Okay, the Shach introduced the concept of, excellent, do that again? Okay, of tradition. Okay, what did the Shach introduce tradition for? What do we need tradition for? Tell me, what is it? Okay, in other words, do I need it to tell me what's kosher and what's not? No, it would seem, reading the Shach here, it has nothing to do with kashrus. It has to do with behema versus chaya. You'll agree with me? The shach is writing on simon pei. Simon pei is telling me to distinguish between behema and chaya, not ayin tet, which is distinguish between kosher and non-kosher. That's how it would seem to understand it, and indeed, that's how the prima godam understands it. The prima godam says it has nothing to do with kosher versus non-kosher. Don't misunderstand it. <laughs> However, we have a big machlokes here. The prima godam says nothing to do with kosher versus non-kosher. It has to do with behemoth versus chaya. However, the Chochmas Adam, who as you see lived early 19th century, Lithuania, the Chochmas Adam was probably the leading 19th century Lithuanian posik, and the Chochmas Adam says, you know what he says? These halachas are complicated. So therefore, we here in Lithuania have a tradition that we only eat animals for which we have a mesorah. We don't rely on the simonim anymore. We don't deal with split hoof and shuitz cod. It's only if we have a tradition. And in his footsteps, following a, uh, a big debate that took place in Israel around the founding of the state, shortly after the founding of the state, the French rabbinate sent a letter to Chief Rabbi Herzog, who was the first Chief Rabbi of the State of Israel, and the French rabbinate asked Rabbi Herzog, we want to import a type of animal called a zebu. A zebu is sort of a kind of cow, and uh, we want to know if it's kosher. Rabbi Herzog said, well, does it have split hooves? Sure, it's kosher. Yes, it's kosher. No, it's not kosher. But, unlike today, then the chief rabbi and the head of the, you want to call it the Haredi community, the Chazanish, had a good working relationship, and uh, Rav Herzog passed on the question also to the Chazanish, and the Chazanish, in two letters that he wrote, is very emphatic. He says that the final decisor for us, Lithuanian yeshiva world, was the Chachmas Sodom. Chachmas Adam said that you need a tradition, and therefore the, uh, the Chazanish said you need a tradition. And more than that, the Chazanish said that the Chachmas Adam understood the Shach correctly, unlike the Prima Godna. So the Chazanish says you need a Mesorah. So there was a little back and forth, they got a little uh, um, uh, sharp with each other. Rav Herzog saying to the Chazanish, if you prohibit it, you're over on the Isra of Baal Tosef. And the Chazanish saying, no. You can't eat it. The, it's not a mintomi from the Torah, but according to the, to the minig of Yehuda Lita, it's also for you to eat the zibu. That's how it ended. Um, we'll, get, uh, we'll continue in a minute from there, but just to jump forward a whole bunch of years, um, 
Those of you who live in Israel and are older than 22 will probably remember that about five years ago, there was a huge machlokis about all meat in the country that, of course, broke out right before Pesach. About three days before Pesach, someone made an amazing discovery that the vast majority of meat in the country comes from South America and that the vast majority of the cows in South America are actually a hybrid of zebu and the regular cow. And so for uh, a few hours there, all the different Ashkok organizations asked for the meat, and then they quickly investigated, and they found out that uh, they're all going to be in big trouble from their housewives if they don't matter at all. And so, except for the, uh, the organization Sheiris, uh, they all matter the, the meat very quickly. But this machlok is between the Chazanish and Rav Herzog really continues to have ramifications till today. So, yes? So doesn't the Gemara say you can't mix the Hemet's mayo with the Hema Sahara? They won't injure beef? Correct. That should prove that the Zebo is not a. Absolutely. The will agree with you. He'll tell you that it's not a problem. However, we now have a minog. The minog, he'll tell you correct. Mid the rice, so you could rely on the simonim. I don't need to do the cross breeding. I have the simonim. Right? For the Torah, I have simonim. Forget about the Gemara sign. So, what the Chazanish will tell you is yes, you're correct. From the Torah, I have the simonim. From the Gemara, I have that additional simon of cross breeding. But um, but I'll say we have a minig. It's a minig that was adopted by all um, all good Jews, you know, meaning Jews from Lithuania, and um, and therefore that minig has to be kept. No, but doesn't that wouldn't that theoretically counteract the the fact that we don't necessarily have Masora at this point? No, no. So I think what he would argue is that you need a Masora today. But you're right. I think it's a strong proof as well. Um, uh, well, the whole story of Fowl is a different story, and we'll have to get to another time. But um, the Chazanish, I don't know if he said anything about Turkey, but yes, it's a much more serious question. Okay, so it seems that we now have science from the Torah, and we have um, a question of Masorah. Do we need a Masorah or not? Now, it's important to point out, on one side we have the Chacham and the Chazanish, say that you do need a Masorah. On the other side we have the Prima Godim, who was considered sort of the uh, final arbiter when you learn Yoridea, the Piskachu of the Kafachayim, um, all of the Temanim and most of the Svardim and many Ashkenazim, including uh, Rav Osner, who seem to say that you don't need a Masorah. <laughs> um, so for all of those Temanim, Svardim, do we have any Svardim here? Other than the best student here, yes, okay. Hi, okay. Okay, so for them you don't have anything to worry about. This is not, it doesn't affect you, at least this stage. But it does have a lot of ramifications for an important question for American Jews. American Jews, I found out yesterday, someone, uh, two days ago, someone wrote a very nice piece about Tishabov, and he explained what the issues here are and what the issues in America. And I hope there's nobody from LA, I don't want to offend you, but it seems that the Dodgers don't yet have kosher hot dogs in their stands. And some Jews in Los Angeles were very disturbed by this. This seemed to be like a, a big issue for American Jews. So another big issue for American Jews is the kashas of this animal, which Americans call buffalo, which is uh, more correctly known as the bison. Is the bison kosher? Well, based on what we've talked about so far, how would you determine if the bison is kosher? Uh, Split hoof shoes cut. That's from the Torah. That's if you're Sephardi, if you're Temani. What else might you be interested in? Is there a Masora? Is there a tradition? And the answer is, there cannot be a tradition on bison. Bison is an exclusively North American animal. There's no way that Rashi saw it. There's no way that uh, the Vilna Gaon saw it. Bison simply didn't exist in Europe. So there cannot be a tradition on bison. So the question that confronted the American Kashrus organizations was, can they give Hashkacha on bison? This was a major issue. A guy in Brooklyn put out an entire country called Kashrut Habizon, where he went through everything that I've told you now, plus a lot more, and, um, yes? Uh, was this soon as you recently, or was it more when people were going out No, west? no, no, they did, when they were going out west, they didn't think about these things. They shechted the bison. <laughs> we have evidence that in Denver, they were shechting bison over 100 years ago. <laughs> but this became, that doesn't, uh, <laughs> the question is, could you establish a Masora like that? Yeah. I don't know, that's a different. Yeah, that's, that's really, that's the, uh, the Tia show part. Okay. And not really, but you want to say about Turkey, maybe. Same thing. You're yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that okay? No, so that, uh, what you could quote me, maybe, if you want, is what Hillel did by Corbin Pesach and Ev Pesach. He said, let's go ahead and do it, and then we'll ask the question. But that wasn't what happened with the bison. With the bison, it wasn't that, you know, they consciously thought it out, said, there's a question, let's do it, and then we'll... They shechted it. The guys who shot out to Denver at the beginning, you know, 200 years ago, they weren't looking for only Mahajan Ashkachas, you know. 
Okay, so no, this was, I don't know, 20, 20 or so years ago this came up. This Kuntris, um, what year is it from? I don't know, it's probably 15 years ago. I don't know exactly when I got it. Anyhow, this guy put out this Kuntris about the Kashrus of the, the bison. This is one of the Kashrus organizations of Brooklyn. And he then collected letters from some of the major poskim in Israel. He understood, you know, these are the big questions in Brooklyn, but Kimitzi on Tetzay Torah. He wrote letters to some of the poskim here. One of the important letters he got was from Rav Vosner. Rav Vosner is a major posik in Bnei Brak. So Rav Vosner has this huge shadow that's being cast over him by the Chazanish. He's sitting in the city of the Chazanish. So what did Rav Vosner write? He wrote, listen, you guys in America, you don't have to worry about that sheet of the Chazanish. It's a Das Yochid. It doesn't seem to really make sense. You know, we don't really understand it. It seems to be the opinion of the majority of poskim that you don't need a Masorah. So in America, no problem, you could have bison. If you would ask me about having bison in B'nai Brak, he said, then I would have to reconsider. That was enough, and based on that, the OU, and at different points, the Star K, and I believe today the uh, Nevada of St. Louis are, uh, who's from St. Louis here, where is uh? He's not here. He's not here, Chaval. Oh, Chaval, because in St. Louis, I believe, is where they're shechting the bison now in America. It used to be they were shechting it in one of the states that those of us from New York are not familiar with. It was near North Dakota, South Dakota, one of those states. We went out to see the bison shechita. This is my friend Ari Greenspan, who I went with. That's a bison in, a, uh, in the holding pen. We're going to skip the video of the shechita. No, no, we're going to skip it now, later, if I guess if the guys want to see it later. Um, this is where the beautiful plains where they shech the bison. Okay, uh, but bison is currently available in America with good hashkachas, nothing to worry about. Life is good. Okay, how about the zebu? As I mentioned, the zebu was one of those things that brought up the, the question. These are zebu that are being raised here in Israel. You can tell the zebu, they're a little different than cows. You see this, this hump on them. Um, that's really what distinguishes the zebu from the, you know, outwardly from the cow. Um, what's interesting, and again, there are a lot of articles that were written about it a few years ago when this was the big issue, issue here in Israel. What I think is quite interesting is that if you go to the, to the shul in Beit Alpha, and I highly recommend that as you travel the country, especially in the Galil and the Golan, you visit the old shuls. Because this is not just like you know, the old shuls on the Lower East Side that are 200 years old. You know, these are 1,500-year-old shuls with mosaics, which we could really learn a lot from. So, for example, this is on the mosaic in the Beit Alpha Shul. And what do you see here? You see what looks like a hump? It looks like a zebu. Now, this doesn't mean that the zebu is treated as kosher. In the mosaics, they have eagles and, and other non-kosher animals as well. What it does tell us is that the zebu was known to the Jews living in the land of Israel 1,500 years ago. And that it potentially there could be a Masorah on it. Unlike your question of the turkey or the question of the bison, there is a possibility that there's a Masorah on a zebu. Furthermore, it seems to me that the artist really highlighted the split hooves. Almost as if to say that, you know, this is a kosher animal. Now, this doesn't prove it. This is not enough to establish it as kosher. But I think that it does show us that it existed here in Israel a long time ago. Okay, so one of the questions that we researched was the kashus of the water buffalo. Water buffalo called in modern Hebrew ta'oah, although it's probably not the same as the biblical ta'oah. It's called in Arabic jamus, and many Israelis call it jamus. Others just call it the buffalo. And the question is, is the water buffalo kosher? Well, how would you know if the water buffalo is kosher? What might interest you? Split of Jewish card and tradition. Okay, so the first thing we'll look at, by the way, this is a young water buffalo. This was the last day of his life. This is an older one who lived to see another day. So the first thing we went, we did, is we went out to see if we could find a Masora. And we found this old man, Rabbi Gwirtz, who was a shoichet in Yerushalayim. And we interviewed him, we brought him, now unfortunately we couldn't bring him to, uh, to see water buffaloes out in the wild anymore. He wasn't able to travel. And word names are not enough. In other words, if I say to him, did you shech jamus, or ta'ov, or buffalo, that's not sufficient, because maybe what he calls buffalo is, you know, the American bison. How do I know? He's talking about the same animal that I'm talking about. So what's very important is that we brought him pictures of the animal. So at least, even if he can't see the live animal, we can know that we're talking about the same animal. And then we asked Rav Gwirtz, we said, were you a shoichet? And we have this all on video. He said he was a shoichet, he shech did Yushalayim. We asked him what year, he said, tough shinchet. It was very interesting. He talked only in Jewish dates. And we said, did you shecht water buffalo? And he said, absolutely. And we said, was it a one-time event or a regular event? And he said, no, by the thousands. 
And we asked them, who's Ashkocha? And he told us who the Rabbonim then were, and who the Henshokhtim were, and indeed it was the leading authorities of Yerushalayim at the time. So here we have what's considered a, a Mesorah, a living tradition about water buffalo. So we thought that was pretty good. You go out to see the water buffalo, split hooves, chew its cud, it's very easy to check, and a Mesora. So we approached the chief rabbi, chief rabbi Omar. I could call him the chief rabbi for another week or so, and then hopefully we're getting another chief rabbi um, with different opinions, as you'll see in a minute. And um, we approached the chief rabbi, and we said, uh, you know what, does it work? I don't think it's going to work. We'll skip the video. We said to the chief rabbi, um, could you give us a letter from the chief rabbinate of the state that you attest to the fact that water buffalo is kosher? Now, I'm going to skip for a minute what he told us and just get to the end that I, I should tell you that it was impressive what he did. We brought him information from textbooks about uh, the fact that they chew their cud and other information about them. And we brought him information about Rav Gvirtz and a few other shaktim who we have a Masora from. What Rav Amar did is he didn't rely on the letters. He went out and he interviewed these guys, which I think is the appropriate thing to do. He personally went and met with a few of the rabbis that we gave him information. But before he got to that point, he said, okay, we have signs in the Torah. We have this um, need by some people for Masora. He said, there's one other thing that I think is important. And that relates to dentition, to the teeth of the animal. Anybody here planning on dental school? Nobody. Okay. Well, here's the story. There's a Gemara that we're not going to read now in length, but uh, when you get a chance, it's worth reading. The Gemara in Chul and Nuntes that talks about what happens if you're out in the wilderness and you come across an animal that you're not familiar with and you want to know if it's kosher. Now remember, no need for Mesora, right? This talking about in the time of the Gemara. What do you need? Just the two signs, split hoof and short cut. Ah, but the Gemara says, what if you have a problem? What if all four hooves of the animal are cut off? Now, how are you going to check? How are you going to check if it has split hooves? So the Gemara says, not to worry. You could check, first of all, its teeth. Check its teeth. If there are no upper front teeth, meaning no upper canines and incisors, you know it's kosher as long as it's not a baby camel. Because the baby camels that haven't grown yet, adult camels, have those teeth, are never in Shafan. I have those teeth, and that's all I have to worry about. So I could check that it doesn't have upper canines and incisors, and it's no problem, it's kosher, as long as it's not a baby camel. How bad if its upper jaw is missing, and I can't check the upper jaw, but it has um, hooves? No problem, the Gemara says. Check the hooves. If you know it's not a pig, it's kosher. How about if it doesn't have an upper jaw and doesn't have hooves? Now what are you going to do? The Gemara says not to worry. Check the back, uh, you have to shakht it first in this case, then check the grain of the meat under its tail and see if it runs warp and woof. If it does and it's not in our road, it's kosher. Where did that come from? I don't know. Either Chazal did a lot of experimentation and determined that kosher animals have this sign or with some sort of tradition. So that's what this Gemara tells us. The Gemara gives us these three ways of checking animals that aren't fully there. You could check the teeth, you could check the hooves, or you could check the, the meat under the tail. Now, what's interesting, the line that we need is over here. Um, where is Avchista? Uchid Avchista, the Om Avchista. Hoya Mahalech Bamidbar, Umatza Behemisha Process to Chatuchot. Its hooves are all cut off. Bodek Pepiha, Im Ein Lashinaim Lamala. If it doesn't have those upper front teeth, Biadua Shehit Tahora. I know it's kosher. Im Lav, what does Im Lav mean? That it does have those teeth. Okay, how do you understand that line? Well, Chief Rabbi Amar says, the Gemara is giving me a bi-directional sign. If it doesn't have upper front teeth, it's kosher. If it does have upper front teeth, not kosher. Most people don't understand it that way. We'll skip Rashi, who's like that. They understand it like the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch Jim simply says, the Shulchan Aruch doesn't give the other side. As far as the Shulchan Aruch is concerned, you're wandering in a desert. If you don't know the animal and it doesn't have upper front teeth, then it's kosher. If it does have teeth, well, I, as the guy in the desert, have to treat it as not kosher because I don't know any better. But once I determine that it does chew its cud, do I care about the teeth? The Shulchan Aruch would seem to say no. 
So that's the big issue. A big machlok is going on in the country today between Rav Amar, the chief rabbi, and many other poskim. According to Chief Rabbi Amar, the teeth are a bi-directional sign. If it doesn't have front teeth, it's kosher. If it does have front teeth, upper front teeth, it's not kosher. Well, therefore, the chief rabbi said to us, you want to know if the, bice, if the water buffalo is kosher. Has split hooves, choose its cud. It has a masura, but you know what? I need to check its upper front teeth. We said, okay, rabbi, let's go for it. And here's the chief rabbi Amar. Here's my friend Ari Greenspan, me, and Zohar Amar. And uh, we took him out to a field trip. We went off to, Moshe, to um, uh, the Chula Valley. I'm sure that you all learned in, in your day schools about the early Zionists, and they fought malaria and drained the swamps. Well, it was all nice and good. They drained the swamps, and now we've refilled those swamps. And the swamps are refilled, and now we have the birds that migrate, and the water buffalo that are, are there in the swamps of the Chula. So we took the chief rabbi to go visit the water buffalo. And here you see him inspecting the hooves of a dead water buffalo. But the problem was, what did he want to check? The teeth. The teeth. The water buffalo are out there wandering. And he's going, come here, water buffalo. And none of them are cooperating. So we said, OK, you know what? These are wild water buffalo. There's a moshav down south called Moshav Bitsaron that raises water buffalo for the milk. Real mozzarella cheese, or what they call uh, mozzarella de buffo in Italian, is made from water buffalo milk. So Moshav Bitsaron raises water buffalo. We took the chief rabbi there. They see with the water buffalo in the background. These were a little bit more cooperative. You see when you yank their mouth open, they open it. But they still weren't fully cooperative. And you see the chief rabbi over here is trying to look in to see if they're upper front teeth. He's getting an OK look, but he's saying, it's not good enough. I need a water buffalo head on my table. So here you go. The next day we had on his, on his table to the chief rabbi's office in Yerushalayim, there's a water buffalo. Now this water buffalo was much more cooperative. He opened his mouth, no problem. And as you can see, as you can see, there are no teeth up there on the front. But we have a clever chief rabbi. He said, how do I know you didn't bring me a juvenile? You know, baby children, he said, don't have teeth, and then they grow in. Maybe the teeth are going to grow in. So thankfully, the guy I work with, Ari Greenspan, is a dentist. And we sent the, uh, sent the, the head off for an x-ray. You have over here, the bottom part has teeth, the upper front part no teeth, and nothing about to come in. And there's something about decay, he insists I write there. I don't really understand that. OK, now, <laughs> just, um, well, not the head, but um, OK. So here's what we're talking about. Here is the head of a water buffalo. OK, if you take a look. Did you, did you skin it in yourself at all? Yeah. Here's the head of the water buffalo. And um, you'll see over here, this is the back. This is where we have the molars and the premolars. This is the front part. And there's no room at all for, uh, for teeth. You see, there's nothing that could have been in there, nothing that ever will be there. The front part, we would have the, the canines and the incisors. There's nothing there. OK, you can pass it around. Everybody can. <laughs> OK. But you have to keep paying attention. OK. So that is the question with the water buffalo. At this point, Chief Rabbi Amar was satisfied, and indeed he issued a psak in the name of the chief rabbinate that water buffalo is kosher. It has split hoof chew its cud, does not have upper front teeth, and there is a mesora. Okay, here's an example of another kosher animal. You see the bottom, bottom canines and incisors, but no upper canines and incisors. However, the big debate that's riveting the country is about the red deer. The red deer is a type of deer, it chews cards, split hooves, um, just like every other deer, yes? Did Rabbi Mark give you permission to say it's kosher? The water buffalo, yes. yes. He issued up that is kosher. Okay, the red deer would seem to be like every other deer. Um, it's called red deer in Europe. In America, it's called elk. It used to be the same species. Today, they found genetic differences, and they, they classified as two different species. But they're more or less identical. The red deer, known as the elk, known in Rav Amar's writings as the Ayal Australi, because the Israeli red deer were imported from Australia, the red deer would seem to be kosher by all standards. However, what do you notice in the red deer? The poor red deer, or maybe the lucky red deer, um, Here you go. Here is the skull of a red deer. You'll notice that he has um, the back molars and premolars. This is the upper jaw. And you'll notice that he has two teeth, one on each side. 
They're unusual looking teeth. They're not coming straight down. They don't seem to have any purpose. According to the evolutionary biologists, these millions of years ago used to actually be tusks that are slowly disappearing. Be that as it may, the rabbis don't care about the millions of years ago. When you look at the jaw today, you see these upper teeth. And so there's today a big question about the kashras of the red deer. Why might you think it's kosher? Because it's split hooves, chew its cud. Why might you think it's not kosher? Well, Rav Amar has this issue with these two teeth. He thinks that because it has those teeth, and again, he's not alone. The Gemara does indeed imply that it's a bi-directional sign. The Shulchan Aruch, for some reason, left out the other side. So many poskim think that it's kosher. Rav Machbud, um, not infrequently, is willing to shech these. When, you, uh, when the program finishes, those of you who don't go back to the States right away, there's a, a red deer farm up in the Golan in Odem. You can go see lots and lots of these red deer. Um, when they get too many, Rav Machbud shechs them. Um, in America, the OU has shechted elk. The OU feels that this is not a reason not to treat it as kosher. The OU has at times shechted elk. Okay, quick, a few other uh, animals. Yak, um, for those Israelis who go off to the Far East, are all familiar. The yak has all the signs, split hoof, chew its cut, doesn't have upper front teeth. We don't know of any Masora, but those who want to drink yak milk, as long as you know it's from a yak, it's kosher. Some of you may remember the New York Times about 30 years ago reported that they found a kosher pig, the Barbarossa from Southeast Asia. It is a pig, it's no way kosher. It looks like a pig, it sounds like a pig, and its digestive system is just like every other pig. Um, so it's not kosher. Why the New York Times thought it might be is beyond anyone's guess. Um, okay, we gotta go quickly. Okay, what? Oh yeah, that was just a joke, but we gotta move along. Yes. Okay, so Masora, dentition, and the last thing we just have to talk about is hooves and other giraffe issues. Um, in the next four minutes, we have to finish everything you need to know about giraffes. Um, for those who aren't familiar with giraffes. Uh, oh, wait, hold on. Let me ask you. Um, you come from all over America. Is there anybody here who in your local kosher butcher shop has giraffe meat? No. Uh, okay, so why don't you have kosher giraffe meat where you come from? It's expensive. Any other reasons? It's also extremely impractical to Okay, anything else? Okay, this is not a good group. Somebody else. Anybody else? Why you don't shuck, Why we don't have kosher draft meat? Okay. What else? Okay. So everybody knows you don't know what shuck it. Okay. Here you go. Um, um, often we hear from people that you don't know where to shuck it. Uh, this, for example, is Mibre sheet. They publish a weekly parsha sheet, and uh, this is already a while ago. Tafshin Samachdal they wrote. The giraffe calls him an etaral, the chorum mutar lochlo, it has all the kosher signs. Ach, who ne asar lachilas, prohibited to eat it. Why? Kevish at Savaro, a rochma od, ve neniodim, ketzer ve hechelish kototo. We don't know where to shecht it. This is what many, many people talk about. Just we'll run through this quickly. If you want to know where to shecht the giraffe, you open the shokhara, kel hashrita, and there's an entire simon, mako mashrita bet savar. Where on the neck do you shecht? And the shokhara then doesn't tell you, you know, by the X, it gives you an upper and a lower boundary. That upper and a lower boundary are true for every animal. And indeed, for a pigeon, you have a few inches. For a cow, you have a big area. Cow's necks are not small either. And for a giraffe, you have close to six feet. Anywhere, Anywhere within the neck. You have an upper and a lower boundary. So for a while, though, I thought I was the only one who knew this, because anybody I talked to told me, oh, no, we don't know where to shock giraffe. So finally, I called up the OU. I spoke to the guy in charge of meat. And he said, anyone who does not know where to shock the giraffe, either knows nothing about the laws of shkita, or cannot hit the side of a barn with a baseball. You can't miss, in other words. It's, um, you have, as you said, the whole neck. Okay, how come we don't have giraffe? Well, here's an interesting one. This, they tell me, is given out in Brooklyn. Some people think Kimi Brooklyn takes a Torah. They have very interesting things there. Um, uh, this was also a good few years ago. I took off the name of the person who write it, wrote it. You'll see why in a minute. Um, he wrote over here, some post can question whether a giraffe's hooves are actually fully split. A camel is listed in the Torah among the animals that do not have split hooves. Indeed, that's true. Although camel's toes are split, their underpart is covered by a thick pad of spongy tissue, which absorbs the pressure when it walks. I don't know exactly what he's talking about. But we'll skip. He says, the Torah does not consider a camel's toes to be fully split. A giraffe has a thin pad underneath its toes. The question is whether a thin pad is significant enough to prevent the hoof 
from being considered fully split. So he tells us that camels have pads, and yet it's not considered split. Giraffes have pads. Does that remove it from being a split of the animals? So we got to go find out the Metsias. Here we go. Here's llama hooves. You know what? They actually look pretty split, don't they? But when you ask the llama to pick up his hoof, you'll see that the whole posterior half is fused. I don't know if you see it so well here, but this whole back part is fused. It's just the front that you see over here that's split. It's in no way a split hoof. How about the camel? Well, indeed, if you look, here's my hoof. It doesn't look split at all. The camel's hoof looks quite split. You don't see, it looks much better on the screen, I gotta tell you. The camel's hoof looks split. When you ask him to pick it up, you'll see that it's not split at all. Okay? So the camel's hoof, it's not pad, it's not, it's not a split hoof. Well, uh, we don't have any time, we're out of time. When you get a chance, go look at Rashi on Vayikra Yud al Chavav. He describes what you see over here perfectly. I have no idea if Rashi in France ever saw a camel or just had a Masora, but he describes it perfectly. How about a pig? Well, a pig we know is split hoof. How do we know? The Torah tells us, and indeed if you look at a pig, hoof is fully split. How about a red deer? Well, a red deer, fully split hoof. If anybody wants to see, here's a deer hoof, and you can see what it means, a fully split hoof. Okay? So that's so now the big question, how about a giraffe? Does the giraffe have a split hoof? And indeed the answer is, it's a fully split hoof. And pictures are not enough, I, I know you all want to see. So here is a giraffe hoof. Um, I apologize for the, the screw here. When we got a taxidermy, the guy thought we wanted to keep it in the living room on display. So we put a screw in. But you could see it's a fully split hoof, just like any other split hoof. Okay. Now, the last thing is, un unfortunately, shh, this audio doesn't play, but there's some Sephardi rabbi in Brooklyn who gave a share about giraffe, and he talked about the problem with de-skinning a giraffe. I don't know why you need to de-skin it for it to be kosher. I don't know what he's talking about, but okay, if you wanted to de-skin a giraffe, we've de-skinned the giraffe. Here is a giraffe being de-skinned, and here is the fully de-skinned giraffe. Just because we're out of time, what happened basically about, oh, this is already about 10 years ago, a giraffe, a giraffe in the Ramad Gan Safari uh, miscarried a full-term fetus. And they called and they wanted to know, did we want to dissect the fetus? Now, how could you pass up such an opportunity? So we said, of course. And we got together a team of veterinarians and a rabbi, and we went and we dissected the, uh, the full-term fetus. A year later, a year later, the Ramad Gan Safari called us up and said, the, the Ramad Gan Safari called up and said that the mother had died. Do you want to dissect the mother? We said, absolutely. But you know, it's Cholomoy Pesach, we said. Could we come after Pesach? And they said, no, you're misunderstanding. This isn't the fetus, this is the mother. It's 17 feet tall. It doesn't go in the fridge. Either you come tomorrow or it goes to the lions. So we, of course, went the next day. And we dissected the mother, and this is de-skinning the mother. And what's very important is um, to clarify the facts. As we said, you need to know, does the, does the animal have upper front teeth? Does the giraffe have split hoof? You can't simply sit in the base medrash and theorize. You can't say, I think I once heard a giraffe have some sort of pad under their hoof, and therefore it's not kosher, or it is kosher. The only way to ask in these kind of questions is to go out and to check out the facts. And this is just a Gemara Sanhedrin that, that mentions that. Um, but in case the rabbis don't want to go out, we published the results of the dissection in English in the Torah Journal and in Hebrew in Truman. And a quick summary of the dissections. Here is the, uh, the abdominal cavity, yeah. the con and the veshed. We went through all the things that might be relevant. And uh, the only thing, that, uh, and of course, we did a CT scan of the head to make sure there were no teeth that were eventually going to come down. So that's it. We're out of time. So um, if there are any questions.